Welcome to Lambs to Lions. You're listening to the weekly podcast with Pastor Matt Funk. This group of students, of course, they're involved in, in one of those brainiac competitions, you know, places that most of us probably never got invited to, you know, where they um, where they go and they compete a bunch against a whole bunch of other intellectual kids. And they ask them questions, you know, like what was the third Roman emperor's second cousin's first name? You know, it's kind of like, and, and they're supposed to know it. And and so they're they're in there, and they've they've got to be there for this competition. And what ends up happening is they end up in this life and death struggle, to where they have to be able to make this decision. And um, you know, the whole the whole idea it's very Hollywood, of course. You know, the way the storm comes in. And, you know, the, the dramatic side of it all. But at the end of the day, um, we do have some dramatic decisions to make, don't we? There's, there's drama involved in our lives. And so, so let's, um, let's start reading in First Timothy, or Second Timothy, sorry, the case with this group of students. They have to, they have to survive, and they got to be able to uh, make a right decision. Amen? And, and the Apostle Paul here in Second Timothy one verses one through eighteen is talking about a decision. Amen. This is what this whole thing's about. He's talking about a decision. He's talking about Timothy. This um, he's talking to Timothy. He's writing this letter and he's telling him that that he made a right decision. And he tells him why he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, but he refers to some other things, and and we'll take a look at that as we go along. But um, anyway, so in your notes there. Um, so what do we see in this movie clip? I mean, this is really um, what we need to be addressing, right? What do, we, what do we see in this movie clip? Well, the first thing we see is we see a group of people who need to make a decision. So every day of our life, we make decisions, but but they are not all life and death. And a life and death decision is a special kind of decision, and, and you want to make the right one when you're in that case, right? And you want to make it on the best possible information, and a lot of times, uh, people, we just make decisions based on somebody else's opinion, on somebody else's idea, something we may have read one time. And we make decisions based on these things, when the reality is we need to be making decisions based on the truth. Right. We need to be able to make those decisions. And, you know, I've often told people, uh, many of you won't know my background, but I wasn't always a pastor, you know. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> hardly, hardly. I, I wasn't even what you would call a believer. I believed that there was a God. I thought, well, sure. You know, I was crazy enough to believe in evolution. I mean, I was crazy. I wasn't that crazy. And so I, I believed that there was a God, but I didn't know him. I didn't have any understanding of who he was and what he thought or anything. I just, I looked around. I was a hunter and a fisherman and spent a lot of time in the, in the outback, in the wilderness, and I just thought, there's no way that this just hatched out of a, a pool of goo, you know, there's no way. It's, it couldn't have happened, uh, all of the diversity in the wildlife, there's just no way that that just happened. And so there had to have been a design and a creator to it, but I didn't know who he was, I didn't have a clue. And I'll tell you what, I was not interested in knowing. I was enjoying my life of sin, you know, drinking, drugs, women, fighting, it was just all like, whoo. It was exciting, you know, all the time. And so I just never ride motorcycles, do crazy things. But at the end of the day, I came to a place where I had to make a decision. And, and my wife, bless God, helped me make that decision um, in her ever so gentle, calm way. <laughs> you know, get out on your knees and say this right now. You know, it was like, okay, yes, boss. But um, And so we have to have that. But, but the second thing we see is we see two decisions being made. One correct and one incorrect. So this police officer, and you didn't see it in this clip, but in the in the library, this police officer, you'll see it a little bit later, um, he decides that they need to leave and, and go out into this storm and try to get away because the snow could just keep getting deeper. Now, being someone who's from northern Alberta, the last thing you want to go out and do is a blizzard because you think the snow is going to get deeper. It's just the wrong place to be, right? right. And so, but he makes yeah. this decision based on this kind of logic that says, well, we'll just get ahead of the storm. Well, you're not going to get ahead of a storm moving at 100 miles an hour when you're walking at three miles an hour. It's not going to happen. So he makes a decision based on this, this incorrect decision. But this young guy, Sam, 
He makes a decision based on information he got from his father that said this, this is a climatic disaster that's happening and you need to stay inside and you need to stay warm. And I love it in the movie because, you know, they're in this library, there's a fireplace, well, what are we going to burn? You know, in my mind, I'd have chopped up the furniture and got more heat, but they decide they're going to burn books, you know, so it's a little bit of a political throw there. But anyway, what? <laughs> burning books, you know, you can't burn books. And so this kid goes, here's a whole section on tax law. Let's burn that. You know? <laughs> right? It's like, I just love that part of the movie. But anyway, because I'd like to burn stuff on tax law too. But so he makes a decision. He makes a correct decision because in the end, they live. This group of people that listens to him, listens to the best information possible. They stay in the library, they stay warm, and they stay alive. And in the end, the, the good news is Sam's father comes and gets them. Because remember in the clip there, he said, stay there and I will come for you. And I think we have to take a look at that because we've got a Lord that said, stay there, occupy, I will come for you. Yeah. And he's going to come for us. And so we need to be in the right position when he comes for us. He's going to come. He's going to appear. We know that. But only those who know him are going to go with him. And so we need to make a correct decision today. So there was two decisions, one correct, one incorrect. And the third thing we see is we see the results of those decisions. We see the results of those decisions. And all those who followed human reasoning in, in the face of solid proof and expert advice perished. You know, as the movie goes on, you see this police officer and everybody following him dead in the snow, frozen to death, right? There's a bit of a grim part of the movie, but that's the reality. The incorrect decision gets us dead. The right decision gets us alive. And this is what we need to be thinking about. So the truth of God's word and our faith in it should be what guides us as we move forward. And so the police officer and those with him refuse to be persuaded. That's your word, is persuaded. Refuse to be persuaded. And we need to recognize that we cannot make sound decisions if we're not persuaded that we hold the truth. It's the truth. When I accepted Jesus, it was because I got a hold of the truth. It resonated inside of me. My in-laws were Christian people. Drove me crazy because they said things like hallelujah, praise the Lord all the time. They, if somebody was sick, they laid hands on them. If a cow fell down, they went out and prayed for it. You know, if the dog was sick, it got prayed for. You know, my brother-in-law crashed on his motorcycle, dislocated his big toe, but he had to go to work. So my father-in-law just laid hands on him and got straightened that toe and put his boots back on and away he went. You know, I'm seeing this stuff as a non-believer. So what are you, you going to do with that information? What are you going to do with that information? Uh, I was in the yard on the ranch, and this big black hail cloud comes over the hill, and you can just see it's rolling across through the foothills, just wiping out everything in its path. My five foot two mother in law comes running out of the house, hundred pounds soaking wet, throws her arms in the air, in the air, and goes, "I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You cannot come nigh our dwelling." And this thing breaks and parts and goes around their land. And not, a, not a, a stalk of grain is bent over. And the neighbors are all just wiped out. And I, I told the story one day, and one of the guys said, man, I'm glad I'm not their neighbor, you know? <laughs> but the, the reality is, is that I saw these things. And I had to make a decision based on what I knew to be true. That there was healing. There was power in the name of Jesus. It was there. I'd never read a Bible. I knew some basic Bible stories, you know, know I had a boat, put some animals in it, and lived. But other than that, you know, I didn't know the whole premise behind it or the truth in it. It wasn't until I saw this that I gained this understanding that, man, God is actually real. He didn't just create all this. He's real and he's active and he's moving in the lives of people. And, and so I had to make a decision based on that. And so our redemption and our successful walk with God depend on us being persuaded. The Apostle Paul said he was persuaded. He was persuaded. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And so twice in 2 Timothy uh, 1 through 118, the Apostle Paul uses this word persuaded. And so we need to take a look at that. So 
So we need to be persuaded. In your notes there, it says, that, um, number one, that there is a gift in us that can be stirred in verses 6 through 7. The Apostle Paul points to this. He says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. A sound mind. He's given us this. This is a gift inside of us. And uh, we, we get that when we accept Jesus or someone lays hands on us. The Apostle Paul points to the fact, he says, that you've got this when I laid my hands on you. And, and you need to stir up that gift. And I think oftentimes in our Christian walk, we don't stir that up inside of ourselves enough. We kind of grow cold and we grow complacent and we, we go through the motions. We come to church. We get involved in different things. But essentially, we're not always stirring that gift that's deep within us that came to us through the laying of hands or, or just our relationship with Jesus. And there comes a time where we have to reignite that fire. we got to get that thing going because it's in that time, it's in that place where we have become intimately involved with the Spirit of God that we make right decisions, that we make sound decisions, that we move forward successfully in our walk. And, and as a pastor, I've been a Christian now for, I don't know, 43 years, maybe a little bit more, a little over 43 years. I was a pastor for over 30 years. And I just couldn't believe something that's done to me over the years was how Christian people with the Spirit of God can make such bad decisions sometimes. I was like, well, wait a second. Where did you get that idea? Oh, well, I read this. You know, I had a, I had a gentleman who was done this for, but he was helping me. With the flooring downstairs and and uh, in the office area what we used to call the office area below this and he was helping me put down the laminate and and he wasn't working so i just conscripted him to come help me do the flooring you know and and, and i got to know this guy a little bit and i discovered that given a 50 50 chance of making the wrong decision he'd get it right every time you know it was just like he just could not make a right decision this guy and, uh, and so I'm trying to be, you know, conscious of where he's coming from. So maybe I can help mentor him and guide him along. And I, I finally he came up with something and I said, where did you get that idea? Oh, I got that from the book of Jerusalem. I was like, what? And he said, oh, yeah, it's, a, it's one of the forgotten gospels. I said, you know what, buddy? Nobody forgot a gospel. Everything that's here should be here. And if it's not. It doesn't need to be. Yeah. Oh, no, no. You need, there's all these other Gospels. And so he was reading all this other stuff, and most of it actually contradicted and denied the truth of God's Word. I was wondering, why is this guy making such bad decisions? I didn't need to worry about it anymore. I knew he was feeding himself falsehood right. instead of truth. And so we need to be feeding ourselves truth. Right. And so power, love, and soundness of mind need to be stirred in us. And with these things stirred in us, then we can make the sound decisions that we need to make. And so they became faith-filled decisions in Timothy's life and in Paul's life, and they need to be faith-filled decisions in our life as well. So in your notes there, what's within us can become dominant or can't become dominant if we don't keep it stirred. So there's a typo there. It should be can't. What's within us can't become dominant if we don't. If we want to, if we want our faith to be dominant in our lives, then it has to be stirred. If we want our love for God to be stirred within us or dominant within us, then it has to be stirred. And so we got to stir these things up. If if you feel that you have a prophetic gift, it needs to be stirred. If you feel that you have a, a gift of healing, it needs to be stirred. If you feel that you have a gift of faith, it needs to be stirred. And then the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy that. He said, you've got power, love, and sound mind. You need to stir this up within you so you make these sound decisions. The second thing is that there's nothing to be ashamed of in your notes. There's nothing to be ashamed of. The Apostle Paul says in verse 8, he says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Don't be ashamed of that. You know, we, we live in a world where they're trying to make us feel ashamed for our faith, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to shame you. They're trying to cancel it. I guess that's the new word, right? They're trying to cancel me. Well, what they're trying to do is shame you into submission is what they're trying to do. And then in um, what verses 12, he says, verse 12, he says, for this reason, I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. 
And then in verse 16, he says, The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiris, for he has often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my change. He wasn't ashamed of anything. And you know, I, I think about when I first got born again, my wife and I ended up in a in a really good solid church, really. It was a it was a faith-believing church, it was apostolic church, it was had a lot of things going for it, but it had gotten dry and a little bit cold probably. There was a long history of, of several of the power families in a, in a divisive struggle in the church. But despite that, the church seemed to move forward and, and still be progressive. But they had a pastor. And uh, man, I love that man. Yeah. He had a physique like a bell. You know, he, he wore he wore cheap Simpson Sears suits. And he had suspenders because, you know, a belt wouldn't hold up his pants and still would slip down. But but he could preach. And, oh, man, he brought a word, you know. And um, and he would throw up his hands, you know, when he was preaching. And you could see, you know, his shirt would be all untucked, pulled out of his pants, you know, and the suspenders hold him up. And, and, and sometimes his pants were a little too short. When he did this, the suspenders went up, you know, you could see his thoughts and things, you know. And... Um, but, but some of the people were like, oh, man, it's so embarrassing. You know, the new people coming to the church, and, and they see this. And, and they eventually drove that man out of the house. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I was just heartbroken because he was my pastor. My goodness, he brought a, he brought a great word, you know. And, and so they hired this other guy. And, and he was a younger man, more dynamic in many ways, and he just packed the church out. But, but he was a fiery charismatic. And... Um, and the gifts of the spirit were moving, and, and oh, people again. Oh boy, that's just we got new people coming to church. You know, that scared them away, and they were ashamed of their pastor, ashamed of where their church was going. And and I probably shouldn't even tell you this story, but but one of the, the guys, he was a bit of a, one of the power families in the church. Everybody thought that he was a big giver, and he wasn't. I was on the board, so I knew that. And, and he comes up to me and he and he's angry. And we had just had this powerful service where people were being healed, and it was just incredible. And he comes up to me right after the service, and he gets right in my face, and he says, that man has to go. I've never seen anything so ridiculous in my life, you know. And, um, and I was just, I was a fairly young Christian at the time, a few years in the Lord, still a little rough around the hedges, you know, bushy beard, <laughs> shoulder-length hair still. And I looked at him, and I said, you want to get out of my face, or the ushers are going to have to carry you out of your feet first. <laughs> <laughs> And, and he backed up, you know, and he was just like, Ooh. and I thought, buddy, you're not going to come and get in my face when I have just seen the power of God come down in this house. And you might be ashamed of it if you are. Find another church, you know. It was just, it drove me crazy. But the Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He wasn't, and, and Timothy wasn't ashamed of him, and Onesimus, he wasn't ashamed of him. And he uses this term, and I think, we've got to stop being ashamed of stuff, right? We, we need to be stop being ashamed of ourselves, for one thing, because shame will stop you from serving God. Right? It will, it will destroy your life. And, and we get that all bottled up inside of us sometimes, and, and my goodness, we just think, well, I'm not good enough for God. And we worry about the day after tomorrow. When Jesus appears, will I actually go up? Well, the question is, do you believe? Because that's the criteria. Charles Spurgeon said, a man is not saved by what he does, but he is saved by what he believes. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You know, and so we have to recognize that it's a question of belief. In the the gospel of John, he uses the term believe, like I forget how many times. It's just over and over and over again. Believe, 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 believe. So what do you believe today? So I don't know whether you're perfect or not, because I got news for you. None of us in this room are perfect. We've all got something. But what happens is the devil comes along and tries to bring that shame into our lives. So we are ashamed and we draw back from God instead of drawing in and allowing him then to bring health and healing to that area that we fall short of. And the Apostle Paul, in, in just a few verses, he uses a shame, not a shame, three times. We are to recognize how important this thing is. And so your faith in Jesus is strength and not weakness. And don't let anybody tell you different. Your faith in Jesus is strength, not weakness. You know, who remembers that Christian comedian, Mike Warnke? Anybody remember Mike Warnke? Yeah? (laughs) 
what members might want. He was funny as all get out. But um, anyway, he, he said one day, uh, he said, yeah, somebody came up to me and they said to me, don't you think that that Jesus is just a crutch? And he said, yeah, that's a great news for a cripple. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're all we're all crippled to a degree, and if Jesus is the crux that we need to, to make sure that we're there on that day, yeah, then we need to be persuaded that he is able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day, or until that day, whatever your translation says. And so, um, so people will try to mitigate you and marginalize you, mitigate and marginalize you because of your faith. But there's nothing to be ashamed of, man. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Don't let society cancel you, cancel your belief because they're trying to make you ashamed. So number three, be confident in your belief. Be confident in your belief. You see, our, our faith in Jesus has a firm foundation. And we can be confident in our relationship with God and, and its establishment in our lives. We don't have to be, who I wonder if God loves me. Trust him. He loves you. Yeah. He loves you. The prayer of Jesus in John 17 is that we would be one as he is one right. with the Father. That's a prayer. Jesus prayed that prayer for all mankind. We would be one. Now, not everybody's going to do it because they don't make the right decision. But we make the right decision. We make it based on, on the truth of God's word and we walk with him. And on that day, he says, come with me. Wow. You know, somebody said to me the one time, they said, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. I said, maybe not that word. It's an English word that we use to describe an event that is clear in the Bible. It's clearly there. Yeah. And, and he said, well, I don't know. I said, well, well, car is not in the Bible either, but you drive one. <laughs> he was like, well, I don't know if that makes any sense or not. <laughs> I said, well, you don't believe you're going up in the first wave? You can stay behind. But me, I'm going up in the first wave. I'm going to have a sinner in each hand, and about 10,000 feet, I'm going to say, get saved, right? Let's go. Okay, you're going up through the clouds. What are you going to do? <laughs> yep. Yeah, you got no parachute. So the Apostle Paul, he was imprisoned and abused, but his faith sustained him. The more we're persuaded by the truth in Jesus, we become unwavering. Become unwavering. Be persuaded by the truth and become unwavering. Number four, be persuaded that he is able to keep you based on your commitment to him. Based on your commitment to him. And so the fact is that the world, we're not saved because we're perfect. We're saved because we made a commitment based on the truth of God's word. And we decided to walk in it. In verse 12, he says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. Be persuaded. Don't let the enemy come and mess with your mind because Jesus isn't confused. God's not confused. And if we have the power and the love and the sound mind that can be stirred within us, then we shouldn't be confused either. He doesn't want us to be confused. He wants us. You know, and in Thessalonians, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about this stuff. I don't want you to be unknowing. We need to know what's going on. I'll probably get a little bit more into that in the main service. But, but for you guys, you're getting, the, you're getting the preview here. So scripture is clear. Scripture is clear about the coming back. But it's just as clear about God's intention for us who believe to miss that wrath. So like, you don't need to go through seven years of trial and tribulation to get good enough for God to accept you. Because if that was the case, you might as well just live happy in your sin until that. But that's not the case. No. We make a decision. We stand firm. And when the Lord appears in the clouds with the trump of God, let Christ rise. We all go up in that. And then, seven years of tribulation begins, where God finishes his business with Israel as a nation, and where he pours out his wrath upon the earth for the rejection of Jesus Christ. It's just so simple. And so many people miss it. They stumble over it. They, 
they they feel ashamed, and so they think, well, I gotta just get this right. I'm so ashamed of what I am. I, I gotta get it right so that I can go home and be with Jesus. And maybe in the end, you know, my dad was uh, he came from a faith where they believed in predestination. You were predestined to be saved, or you were predestined to be lost. And uh, so you just lived a good life, and hopefully in the end it was up to the judge and you'd be okay. Well, I got born again, and I realized, no, Dad, that's wrong. And we would debate back and forth, you know. And one day he was about 81 years old, and my mom had passed away, and he lived in his house for as long as he could, and, and he had failing health, he had emphysema really bad, and he moved into a lodge where, you know, they made your meals and stuff, and he had his own room, and, and he phoned me one night about 8 o'clock, and he just said, he said, son, he said, you know, they had a, a young guy came and brought him, a service at a church service tonight in the lodge. And he said, for the first time in my life, I understood the gospel. He said, I went down up front and I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. <laughs> wow, I couldn't even speak. I couldn't even speak. The tears welled up in my eyes. And I thought, my dad, who had been a great man throughout my whole life, and never had a speeding ticket because he was afraid of missing that day, came to an understanding of the truth. A couple of years before he died, and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, and confidently went home to be with him. Yeah. No fear of, well, it's up to the judge. He knew in his heart, I'm saved. And so understand, God does not want us to be confused about this stuff. And so we need to be persuaded that faith in God's power is able to keep us. Faith in God's power is able to keep us. And my last point. I'll finish here in a couple of minutes. Remember that our faith produces good things and not bad things. Our faith produces good things and not bad things. Verse 13 says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, that good things, <laughs> that good things which was committed to you, that good things committed to you, keep. By the Holy Spirit who dwells. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing that we have in Jesus Christ. And so there's there's a good thing. And it's committed to us when we accept Jesus Christ. He will sustain us. This is a good thing. And the good thing that Paul speaks about is faith. He's talking to Timothy about the faith that was instilled in him through his mother and his grandmother. And so we need to recognize that someone has instilled faith in us. For me, it was my wife. She instilled faith. And so I stir that up. If I ever, in my walk, got to that place where I was thinking, like, what was I doing? I just thought about my wife telling me to get down on my knees and accept Jesus Christ and repent of my sin. And I was just, like, confident once again. Yeah, 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 that's right. I did that. Sometimes I've gone back to the first principles that I learned as a Christian and I said, why do I believe this? Oh yeah, A, B, C, D, there it is. That's why I believe what I believe. And we, and we continually go back to that. Why? Because it needs to be stirred up within us. We need to recount it. We need to remember it. You know, uh, the, they were told to write down a battle. Uh, Moses was told to write down about a battle so that it could be recounted. So that it could be recounted that this was a victory. This was a victory. Your salvation is a victory. Relive it. Recount it. Somebody told me one time, they said, you need to forget about your testimony. I said, well, that's kind of like forgetting about myself. Right? <laughs> and that's what reminds me how I got here right. and who I am in Christ. And I am so grateful and so thankful that I'm not laying in a ditch someplace right. with a knife stuck in me, you know, or a gunshot. It's just like, man, lots of my friends, they're in the boneyard, I'm telling you. And the fact of the matter is, I could have been one of them. Drug overdose, whatever. And uh, forget about that, are you kidding? I don't know who that guy is anymore. If I, if I look at pictures of myself from back then, I go, man, I can't believe anybody actually liked that guy, you know? But at the end of the day, I need to remember it. Amen. Because yeah. I need to stir it up. Yeah. Yeah. This on. is what God did for me. Amen. And he didn't do all of that to make me suffer for seven more years. Right. He did that. He brought me into this place so I didn't have to right. pay that bill. So let's recognize that, guys. Right. Proper faith-filled decisions produce proper faith-filled results. 
That's good. Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am persuaded. Wow, there's that word again. Well, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Could Paul have added any more things to that? <laughs> There's nothing, nothing that can separate us from that love that God has for us. And we must be persuaded in that today. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Let's just close in prayer, guys. You know, if you're here today, I don't know everybody in the room, but um, it would be presumptuous of me to think that everybody needs to be born again except for Jesus. So if, if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, then I want to give you that opportunity to do that. We'll, we'll pray for you. All the men in this room will pray. And, and you can go on be persuaded that he is able to keep that which you've committed to against that day. So if there's anybody today, would you just slip up your hand? I think pretty much most of you have probably accepted the Lord. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be here at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but uh, let's pray. Father, we bless you today. We thank you, Lord, for pouring out upon us today. We thank you for the day that's ahead, Father, the week that's ahead, the months and the years, you, Lord, that as we walk with you, we, we do so on an increasing scale. Yeah. We just gain an understanding. We gain in knowledge. Continue to stir the spirit that is within us, Lord. And so, Father God, I just commit each and every man in this room into your care. And I thank you, Father, for strengthening them as they walk with you. I pray, Father God, that, that we make faith-filled decisions that produce faith-filled results. And so, Father, as we commit ourselves to this day, we look forward to the main services, Father, as, as people come and join us here. Yes. We pray, Father God, for an outpouring in their lives. Yes. We thank you for strengthening us, Father. We thank you for the, those who do not know you that will come through the doors this morning. We commit them into your hands, Father God, that they would have an understanding of the truth and that they would walk a life of faith from this day forward. And so we commit it all into your hands today, Father. Just bless you, Lord, now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you for tuning in today and thank you for continuing to partner with us and for giving so generously to this ministry. If you would like to find out more about how you can partner with us, visit our website at www.wherepeoplematter.church and click the giving link. And don't forget to subscribe and share this with your friends. See you next time.